Hi everyone, and welcome to yet another virtual chemistry lesson, where we will start going into uh, the thermochemistry part of the Chemistry 1 course. Uh, during this part we will deal with such concepts as heat and energy, and as you see we have a nice picture here of some hot glowing embers. Um, maybe you have sat down uh, some time in your life and thought about what actually happens in here. What causes this to continue to glow like this and continue to produce heat over time? Because something, there must be some sort of explanation for this. And I hope that after you've finished the thermochemistry part of this course, you can answer such questions and uh, discuss concepts involved in the processes that's going on here. So that's my ambition. This will be an introduction to the concepts of heat and energy, and I will also talk about specific heat capacity of different materials. So, let's start by uh, talking about energy. Energy is uh, formally defined as the capacity to do work to cause an object to move against an opposing force. What this pretty much means is that it's things happening in general. In order for something to happen, there must be energy behind it. And energy may take many different shapes. We can talk about chemical energy, which we'll do during this course. We can talk about heat. We can talk about light, electricity, sound, and so on. And very often we convert one shape of energy into another. For example, we can convert electrical energy to light in a light bulb like this. Uh, the old timey light bulbs that we used to have, they also generated quite a lot of heat. They got really, really warm. And if you put your ear very close to it, you heard a slight vibration. So the elect electricity, electricity was converted to heat, light and energy here. Um, but I mean, that's not just limited to technology. For example, um, the chemical energy in your food that you eat is converted to your body heat and uh, processes within your body to build things up. So, we're not going to talk about electricity during this part of the course, or any part of this specific course, uh, at least not in relation to heat. And what we will talk about is chemical energy and heat, then. In order to do that, we need two terms. We need the term system and we need the term surroundings. A system is defined as uh, our area of interest, what we are looking at, what we're studying at the moment. That may be, for example, a beaker, like you have a poor drawing of here, where a Maybe you have a reaction going on that's taking its sweet time. Uh, if you're focusing on this beaker, that will be your system, your reaction system. And then the rest in the universe will pretty much be the surroundings. And energy is continuously transferred between the system and its surroundings. This is not something we can uh, get around. If we have a beaker with water standing in a room, and the room has a higher temperature than the water within it, then we will have energy flowing from the surroundings into the system. But if the surrounding temperature in the room decreases, then energy will flow from this water out to the surroundings again. So we have a continuous flow of energy back and forth between systems and their surroundings. Systems may also be closed or open. A closed system, it cannot change matter with its surroundings, only energy. Think about having a completely sealed glass uh, top of this beaker here. So we have a glass cube of some sort or a glass cylinder, completely sealed. If we had water in there, then that water wouldn't be able to uh, leave that system, then it would be completely closed. Whereas an open beaker like this, we will have uh, molecules evaporating over time, uh, even at room temperature. 
so we will not have matter conserved within here. It will go out into the surroundings and particles will fall down, dust particles will fall down and so on. So then we have an exchange of both matter and then this energy. And here's a thought for you. Is the Earth an open or closed system? Because we can actually our area of interest is a rather vague concept, right? If we study the entire climate of the Earth, then that will be our surroundings. So is the Earth an open or closed system? Well, you probably heard about meteorites falling down onto the Earth. So we have matter coming into here. We also send up, for example, satellites. Uh, out through the atmosphere and out into space. So then we have a matter being transferred between the universe and the Earth. So the Earth is in a way then an open system because we have matter being transferred back and forth here. Energy, of course, is also transferred here. That's why the sun can heat the planet up. Uh, otherwise, if a transfer of energy was not possible, the planet wouldn't increase in temperature either. A system may be something incredibly small, something on the microscopic level as well. So what's the system and what its surroundings are, are rather vague concepts. Pretty, pretty much what you look at at the moment. All right, heat then, a type of energy that we will discuss. Heat, well, energy flows from warm objects to cooler objects and this is what we describe as heat um, and this is for example as you probably notice that if you have two objects next to each other then the uh, energy will flow from the warmer object to the cooler objects say that you put a cool uh, pot on your stove and then you turn on the stove the plate on the stove uh, gets warmer and then the pot itself it also gets warmer over time uh, as energy is transferred from something hot to something that's colder. And we need to explain this a little bit better than, I, than I, what I just did. We need to talk about the kinetic energy of particles. And that probably rings a bell. We talked about that when we talked about temperature a little bit. But we'll go back to that and we'll get a little bit deeper into this now. So temperature can be considered the average kinetic energy of particles within a system. And then this kinetic energy can be transferred to other particles, which is why temperature is transferred as well. Hmm. Well, solid substances, for example, they can also get warm. You know that the plate on your stove can get warm if you turn it on. Uh, that heat then is uh, vibrational motion. The particles w that make out uh, or make up your not make out sorry that make up your stove plate vibrate more and more and more faster and faster and faster as the heat is turned up. So more vibrations at higher temperatures. Uh, this is not a picture of the particles within a stove, but it's a uh, nice picture showing how molecules and particles vibrate. And when we look at liquids and gases, they exhibit a few different types of motions. They have, because remember that motion and kinetic energy, that's the energy associated with motion, right? So Liquids and gases, well, then we talked about that the particles move about, they switch places. In a gas, they will spread out to fill the shape of the container. So here we have a few different types of motion as well. They still vibrate the particles, but they can also move around in linear patterns like this. That's called translation. And they can also rotate as they do this, spinning around and around and around. Uh, so many different types of motion going on and as you can see as they collide they transfer that Kinetic energy that motion to each other pretty much like uh, billiard balls being knocked into each other 
So this is how we need to think about temperature and therefore also heat energy. So let's make a thought experiment. Uh, what happens when we put a teapot on uh, a propane gas stove? Well, we turn on the stove, we ignite the propane, and we will have a, chem uh, a chemical combustion. So propane will be combusted according to the following reaction formula. And when we write a formula like this and we talk about energy, then we can write energy as a product because energy is being produced by this reaction. We'll get back to that in a future video. Um, as the en if we have a lot of energy being released, that's going to take the shape of kinetic energy of the carbon dioxide and water molecules that are the products of this chemical reaction. So the water molecules and the carbon dioxide uh, molecules formed in this reaction will have a very high speed and they will bump into the bottom of the teapot very hard, very fast. And what does that do to the teapot? Well, that will cause the metal atoms that make up the bottom of the teapot to vibrate more and more and more as they're getting hit and hit and hit over and over again by high kinetic energy gas particles. Okay. If the vibrations in the metal atoms increase more and more and more, these will then spread through the bottom towards the inside of the pot, where we have water molecules that are touching the surface of the pot. These water molecules, uh, they are in the liquid state, uh, but they will still absorb that energy. It's being transferred from the bottom of the pot to the water molecules, and they will move around within this pot. They will collide into each other and spread that energy out throughout all of the water. So we will have the average kinetic energy within that pot of the water will slowly increase over time. That is the increase of temperature over time. And eventually uh, steam will start to form as uh, we have enough energy to cause the vaporization of water like this. And then we can write that it takes energy to um, cause the water in the liquid state to vaporize into water into the gaseous state like this. So we need to get into a frame of mind where we visualize everything as different collections of particles. Whether or not they're organized in a solid state, they don't move, but they will vibrate. Those vibrations can be translated to uh, particles that move within the liquid state and the gaseous state. And this is how temperature is being transferred and heat therefore being transferred as well from hot to cold. Another very interesting thing when we talk about this is that different substances differ in their capability to store energy in the form of heat. Uh, and this is a phenomenon that we call specific heat capacity. And I'm going to make a rather, uh, some would argue, poor, but a quick experiment to just illustrate the phenomenon here. So what I did is I took 15 minutes uh, while working with other things. Uh, the busy life of a teacher, um, but I took out a uh, a coin, fem krono, which um, pretty much means sweet, five Swedish crowns. And I put them in a beaker with water, and I put the whole thing on a hot plate. Turn on the hot plate, uh, this way I will have water and the coin having the exact same temperature. After a while, the temperature was 85 degrees Celsius, then I turned off the plate, I then poured the water over into a beaker and then moved the coin into another beaker. So both of them are placed into new beakers and the new beakers then have the same temperature as well. I waited 15 minutes and uh, then I just checked the temperature of the water and the coin. The water still had, uh, uh, still showed a 45 degrees Celsius whereas the coin was down to room temperature already. So I'd like to point out that there's a systematic error here. I would, it would have been better if I had a uh, the same mass of water and the coin, 
but this was just something I threw together very quickly here. But if we, that would have given us more comparable uh, aspects of water and the coin. Uh, because we don't know if uh, mass influences this as well. So, however, I can tell you that even if we had the same mass of water and the coin, we would note that the metal cools down faster than the water does. So apparently, the ability to store heat then differs between water and metal, in this case, this coin. Uh, and I mean, we could many, do many different types of experiments like this. We could, for example, just compare a few different beakers of water with a different mass within them to see how the mass influences the time it takes for the all of the energy to be lost. Um, so, and then we'd find out that, yes, the more we have of a substance, the more the longer it will take for that to cool down. So the more mass we have, the more heat we'll retain. Um, and if we check different substances, we will have different abilities. So even if we have the same mass, dependent on what we look at, we will have different uh, abilities to retain heat. So apparently this concept of retaining heat is a specific property for different materials. And the higher the difference in temperature between the system and the surroundings, then the more energy is transferred. If we have a beaker with water at 100 degrees and we let that cool down, then more energy is transferred in total than if we had a water at 50 degrees cooling down to room temperature. So, and these all these are all factors that influence how much heat is being transferred from between system and surroundings. So specific heat capacity is a property uh, that's uh, specific for different materials and it's defined the following way. It's the heat needed to increase the temperature of a unit mass of a material by one Kelvin. So how much energy, how much heat do we need to increase the temperature of a, uh, say, say, a gram of a material by one Kelvin. And here is a formula that we have and we will use, where the small c is then the specific heat capacity. So, this is a formula that we use to uh, talk about how much energy is being transferred, how much heat is being transferred between a system and its surroundings. Q, that's the heat energy gained from the surroundings or lost to the surroundings. That depends on if the value is positive or negative. Its energy, so the unit, is that of Joule, which is written as a big J. The small c, that's specific heat capacity. And that's a constant for a given material. For example, a coin or water. The unit for that is joules per gram per kelvin. Uh, small m, you've seen it before, it stands for mass. And when we talk about chemistry, it's often expressed in grams. Uh, and we need to make sure that the constant we use has grams in it, as well as uh, our mass has grams in it, so they match up. Otherwise, we need to make sure they do that before we do our calculations. Delta T is calculated the following way. You take the final temperature minus the initial temperature. The unit is Kelvin, but remember that one Kelvin is the same uh, width or uh, span width of uh, temperature than, the, than one Celsius, right? So it's, it's just we start countering from the point of water melting that's zero degrees Celsius, but uh, Kelvin starts at absolute zero. But the difference between one Kelvin and one Celsius in uh, how big the step is, is the same. So, how can we use this then? Let's look back at the coin, which I've taken a little photo of here. So how much heat energy was released by my coin in my experiment? Uh, and now I'm thinking after I took it out from the hot water and let it cool down. 
Well, first and foremost, we need to know what the coin is made of, because we need to look at the specific heat capacity here. The coin is actually made from an alloy of 89% copper, 5% aluminium, 5% zinc, and 1% tin. This is an alloy that's called Nordic gold. Uh, but for simplicity's sake, let's assume that it's made from 100% copper. That will make it easier. So, we know that the coin drops from 85 degrees to 20 degrees Celsius. You know that the mass of the coin, or you don't know, but I measured it in uh, on a scale, and that's uh, 6.07 grams. And you look up in a table that the specific heat capacity of copper is 0 0.385 joules per gram per Kelvin. All right, let's start by calculating the temperature difference. We take the final temperature, which in this case is what we end up with, which is 20 degrees, minus the initial temperature, which was 85 degrees, then we'll get a value of minus 65 degrees Celsius. And since this is a difference between two temperatures, that will be the same as uh, the number of kelvins we have in a difference here. Because you can think of it like that. We could convert these values to Kelvin by adding, uh, what is it, 273.15, if I recall? Don't quote me on that, but you add the constant for Kelvin to both of these, but then that would be subtracted from both of them as well. So you could just take the degrees Celsius minus each other and then just write it as a K like this. We look at our formula. Well, then we put in everything we have. We have all the pieces required for this formula. So we put that in, and then we find, get a negative value like this, minus 151.90 joules. And note that this is a negative value, and that means something in chemistry. And we'll go, uh, we will get into this concept even more as we move on to future videos. Um, but when the value for energy is negative, that will indicate that the system, uh, the energy, sorry, the energy flows from the system to its surroundings. So, if the value for Q, for this heat energy, or this change in heat energy, is positive, then the heat flows from the surroundings to the system. So the system will heat up. But if the value for Q is negative, then the heat will flow from the system to its surroundings instead. To try and reach a balance here of equal temperature between the system and its surroundings. So, that were some uh, introductory concepts to thermochemistry. I hope you found this video informative. And at least if you're my students, <laughs> you will be forced to uh, watch another video in the future. So I'll see you there. Uh, so that's it for now. Thank you for your attention.